Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi has delivered a speech on China's views on the international situation and the country's foreign relations, where he reviewed China's diplomatic activities and foreign policy practices in 2022 and looked ahead to 2023. What were China's diplomatic highlights this year and how will China break new ground in diplomacy next year? To help us answer these questions, I'm joined today by Helga Zab LaRouche, founder and the president of the Schiller Institute, Zhao Hai, director of international political studies of the National Institute for Global Strategy, and Harvey Zoldan, senior fellow of the Center for China and Globalization. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qin Duo. Welcome to the discussion. Helga, I will start with you. Uh, in his speech, Wang Yi reviewed the international situation and China's foreign relations. Uh, so how, do, you know, how does China see today's world and how do you describe China's diplomacy in 2022? I think it was amazing because, as you know, <clears throat> Xi Jinping attended various summits, uh, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the G20 summit, the S Shanghai Corporation summit, the Riyadh summit, and I think all of these, and I left out the APEC summit in Bangkok, all of these participations uh, demonstrated that China is now a very well established major player <clears throat> in the world. And if I can say my personal opinion, you know, I mean, the world would be in a terrible shape if China would not be there because it has clearly become an anchor of stability. And uh, if there's any chance that the world will get ever out of the many crises we have right now, it will be because of the policies of China. I know that that view may not be shared by all people in Europe, but I have come to the conclusion that that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, Harvey, what do you see are the highlights uh, of the Chinese diplomacy uh, in the past year? I think the highlights are that uh, President Xi has... Uh, met with, uh, I think, over 40 world leaders, that he's uh, gone to all these uh, summits, that China has been proactive, and that, uh, in a sense, uh, it's no more uh, uh, bide your time and hide your strength, that China is out there as uh, one of the two leading powers in the world, and I, I think that really sums it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Zhao Hai, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi underscored the Global Development Initiative uh, proposed by China, you know, people call it the GDI sometimes, and also the Global Security Initiative, or GSI, uh, as two major initiatives of China's uh, uh, head of state diplomacy. He said the international community responded favorably to GSI, for example, uh, which was unveiled in April this year. Uh, first, tell us, you know, what's the behind the two initiatives? You know, what's the Chinese philosophy or the thinking behind the two initiatives? Well, I think because um, from China's perspective, looking at today's world is very unstable and chaotic, and the war is broken out, and the world experiencing all kinds of crises. And the two initiatives is offered to the world because China believes that these two are uh, missing or having great deficit in today's world. And that's why China wanted to stand out, raising the flag and call upon other countries to focus on and take priority of development and also global security and put that at the center of the world top issues so that countries can find their common denominator and unite against uh, the confrontation, conflict, division of the world and find common solutions to the challenges that we're facing in today's world. Mm -hmm. Well, Helga, you know, how do you see these two initiatives like uh, or what kind of a role uh, they are going to play, for example, you know, development initiative or security initiative? Uh, uh, in what a sense they will be so pragmatically help the world uh, probably to be achieving more peace and stability and more development? Well, I think the GDI uh, clearly complements the Belt and Road Initiative because it focuses on a lot more projects, you know, which are not just major infrastructure projects, but you know, trade relations, uh, helping developing countries to overcome all kinds of difficulties. So I think the GDI is very much appreciated by the developing sector. I think the Global Security Initiative 
is probably the most important tool existing on the world right now uh, to make sure the world is not ending up in a thermonuclear war. I'm very concerned, and there are many people in Europe and even in the United States who are extremely concerned that the Ukraine crisis uh, has taken a turn for the worse after the trip of President Zelensky to Washington, because there he came back, you know, or the line afterwards is that under all circumstances, Ukraine must be defeated. Now, from the Russian standpoint, Ukraine, uh, I mean, Russia cannot afford and will not allow to be defeated either. So therefore we are in a, in a real danger of a terrible uh, escalation. And I think the global security initiative could bring a new level. You know, I, I have thought about that a lot that the world urgently new, needs a new security architecture which takes care of the security interest of every country on the planet, because the past history has shown that peace treaties or any attempt to manage a situation which does not take into account the interest of every country uh, is, is going to fail. And I think from that standpoint, the combination of the global security in, uh, initiative and the global development in, initiative focusing on development is probably the kind of you know, intervention which which could bring a new paradigm, because you know the Schiller Institute for a very long time believes that the new name for peace is development, and even Ukraine. If you want to, this country is 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 being destroyed. People are dying for no good reason, and I think the people of Ukraine have deserved the hope to be rebuilt, and it can only be rebuilt, in my view, if you have an extension of the Belt and Road Initiative into all of Eurasia, whereby Ukraine would be a kind of a bridge uh, between Europe and Russia and, and the rest of Asia. So I think, you know, I'm really looking forward that China and President Xi Jinping will formulate this uh, global security uh, initiative in a very forceful way. And I'm sure that if he and China would appeal to the whole world community, I mean, this the world war is not a question just of Russia and the United States. It's a question of the existence of civilization. And I think if President Xi would appeal to the BRICS Plus, to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, to the Eurasian Economic Union, to the African Union, to all organizations of the global South and say, look, we are in danger of losing civilization. And this is how we offer to get out of it. I'm sure the overwhelming majority of countries would respond positively. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speak of that, you know, a multipolar world. Uh, Harvey, we see uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, you know, from September to December, in his visits to the uh, summit of, of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and also the G20 summit, and the APEC meetings in Bangkok, you know, that's uh, a lot of uh, uh, multilateral or bilateral meetings there. Uh, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi called that a good start to the work of the uh, CPC's new collective central leadership in China's foreign affairs. Uh, so what do you make of those uh, trips, you know, all those meetings by President Xi, you know, with uh, very important leaders from very important countries and regions, you know, Europe, US, the Central Asia, Russia, etc. Uh, so do you see China as a, probably a strong supporter of this multilateral or multipolar uh, world? Yeah, obviously uh, I do. And obviously the situation seems to have changed a great deal uh, since uh, COVID started. Uh, China has been out there um, leading uh, on many fronts. And it shows that China has resumed its historic position, a position it held for hundreds and thousands of years actually as a world leading country. So it shows that China is fully engaged in world affairs on both a global and a regional basis. And uh, it shows uh, that China is going to continue to have this role. And I think one, one uh, meeting that you didn't specifically mention, but that I consider very important, is President Xi's uh, most recent trip, the, the first China Arab State Summit and the China Gulf Cooperation Council Summit in Saudi Arabia. So I can say about the only good thing that Donald Trump did was uh, to pursue 
what we now call the Abraham Accords. Uh, and they have really reshaped uh, Israeli Middle East relations and global relations to some extent. But China has now shown it's a major player in the region as well. And it shows that China knows how to run international diplomacy as well as any other country. And as U.S.-Saudi Arabia relations have cooled, China has definitely stepped in to fill the vacuum the U.S. has left in the region. It's really going to be very interesting to see how both China and the U.S. adjust to the new Israeli government, uh, the most right-wing in the country's history. I think it's going to be challenging to China, challenging to the U.S., and challenging to much of the rest of the world, actually. Mm, interesting observation there. Uh, Zhao Hai, you know, picking up on what, uh, from what uh, Harvey has said about the China-U.S., uh, we know that, finally, there was a summit between the two leaders, President Xi Jinping and his U.S. counterpart, Joe Biden, on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Bali. Uh, obviously, that's a successful meeting between the two leaders. And after that, uh, we are looking at the implementations by officials at different levels from the two countries. So overall, you know, if you look back and also probably into the uh, next year uh, on the bilateral relationship, uh, what's, your, what's your understanding? You know, see, we are on the right track to a healthy and a stable relationship? I think after the uh, China-U.S. Uh, summit, at Bali, uh, at least what we can say is that uh, the two sides resumed uh, communications on all levels, and these increased communications would likely to contribute to a better relationship, more stable relationship between the two sides. However, questions remain and differences remain. So uh, we remain sort of, sort of cautiously optimistic about next year's China-US relationship. So far, we can uh, see that uh, in the past year, um, China-U.S. relationship experienced bumpy uh, relationship. Uh, in the beginning of the year, um, China and U.S. tried to improve relationship. However, that was disrupted uh, by the conflict, uh, conflict in Ukraine. And also after that, disrupted by uh, the uh, visit of uh, Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. And then after that, there's uh, also escalation on the U.S. side, trying to suppress China's technological development by sanctioning uh, or putting up this uh, entity list, uh, putting more Chinese companies into the entity list. So throughout the year, you can see that, um, you know, verbally, the U.S. always say they, they want to stabilize relationship. They wanted a guardrail. They wanted uh, communications, you know, dialogue with China. However, in practice, the U.S. continued to uh, provoke China on various issues, uh, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and various uh, interference into Chinese domestic politics. So overall, I would say that uh, even with these uh, remaining problems, hopefully we can find a common ground, a common solution uh, for the future of China-U.S. relationship, find a uh, uh, sort of a leading uh, guideline for both countries to work with each other on various uh, issues, common challenges that I mentioned, like climate change, uh, and also, you know, fighting back against the, uh, the uh, COVID and other possible, uh, you know, uh, disease around the world, and also helping developing countries uh, to get out of poverty and debt, possible debt crisis. So I think there are many things needs to be done. And uh, unless China and U.S. work together, this world will be more divided and will create more problems. So hopefully next year will be a good year for China-U.S. relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Haga, obviously, you know, China and the U.S., the two largest economies and two probably most powerful countries in the world now, uh, the two countries, you know, their relationship, their interaction or engagement uh, uh, has, uh, uh, I mean, a very big influence impact not only on the two countries but also around the world you know the chinese side has complained as uh, joe Hai point, pointed out you know uh, complained about the u.s suppression of the chinese attack development or you know the uh, refusal to lift the tariffs on the chinese products or the you know in some cases a provocation provocation for example over taiwan issue i mean if there's a you know the republican uh, Speaker of the House, uh, McCarthy, uh, likely uh, in January, uh, if he becomes the Speaker. And the, the, we are going to see, likely to see, a repetition of provocation over Taiwan again. So how do you see the bilateral relationship, uh, for example, in 2023? Well, I'm not optimistic uh, if the present trends uh, uh, are continued. 
because you know while China is uh, steadily doing what it's doing, focusing on the issues, what we have seen with the 20th uh, Party Day, you know, rejuvenation of China, all of these things, it's not a threat. Nevertheless, the United States in the recent uh, National Defense Authorization Act portrays China as the big threat. And I think that if we don't get a new dimension into the international politics, what we will see in 2023 is a crusade against China. Uh, I think that you know what, what the conflict over Ukraine is with Russia will be continued on an accelerated rate against China. That's, that's if you read all the security papers of the United States, and of the British, by the way, who always have an instigating role in the anti-China campaign. And they have their minions in the different governments in Europe, including, unfortunately, in the German government. Uh, so I think it forebodes not good. Uh, the NATO summit in Madrid uh, last June you know, decided to have a global NATO that will have a tremendous uh, destabilizing effect in the whole Indo-Pacific in you know the whole idea to have a global NATO is it's no longer a, a, a North Atlantic uh, defense treaty. It's a it's an offensive effort to control the unipolar world, and that does not function because that unipolar world does not exist anymore. So I think we have built in a lot of very very serious uh, 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 problems for the coming year. And I think it needs a grand vision. You know, I think if you project the present trends, I, I'm almost certain that it will end up in a catastrophe. But fortunately, human beings are creative. They always can come up with solutions which are on a higher level than the level on which the problem arises. That was Einstein who said that, but also Nicholas of Kuhs, a great thinker of the 15th century. Uh, so I think a vision is necessary. And I, I really... I have great hope that you know the present constellation of the BRICS plus, you know, I mean, 17 countries have uh, asked for full membership in the BRICS. I mean, that is not a sign of mistrust. That is a sign that the momentum of history is clearly shifting in the direction of a new world order. And I know that the United States and Great Britain and unfortunately the EU bureaucracy, they want to suppress exactly that, the emergence of such a new order. But these countries, the BRICS plus, SCO and, and others are already representing the vast majority of the world. The BRICS alone already has a higher GDP than uh, the G7. And if you add these 17 countries, it will be the vast majority of the world uh, in terms of population, in terms of productive powers. And I think more efforts, and I know it's it's hard because if you're all the time rejected, it's very difficult to repeat it. But I think more offers to cooperation uh, to the United States, to the European nations, uh, because they would benefit so much if they would stop this geopolitical confrontation and just say the problems of humanity are so vast. We have world a world food crisis, 1.7 billion people are in danger of starvation. You have a world health crisis, which is not over despite COVID easing a little bit. But you know, no, which country has a modern health system? Very few. Uh, so we have poverty, you know. Uh, people who are poor do not have a fulfilled life because mm -hmm. if you have to worry about your next meal, then you are just not fully uh, able to develop your creative potential. So I think an appeal uh, coming from the BRICS plus uh, and the other organizations where China is a major partner in to, to the United States and to Europe and say, let's stop this geopolitical confrontation because the existence of mankind is at stake. Let's join hands and solve these problems together. So I think we need to have a new paradigm. We have to have mm -hmm. a jump a, a into new the next phase. paradigm. Uh, yes. yes, have a... Uh, you know, in what way, like uh, the both countries uh, say, you know, we need to give up probably the practice of zero sum competition or engagement or confrontation between Beijing and Washington. Probably we should, uh, uh, you know, what else do we need to do to stabilize the relationship, for example? Well, I think uh, the U.S. has to decide what its position is. 
when uh, Blinken first took his post as Secretary of State, he said the position of uh, Sino-U.S. relations would be for America that competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. But I haven't seen much emphasis on the collaborative, only on the competitive, and only on the adversarial. And also, I think the U.S. is, uh, is playing a game here, and the game's called good cop, bad cop. So you have, like at the meeting in Bali, a lot of nice words that were uh, spoken, but you also have U.S. actions trying to economically and politically encircle China. I don't think that that's a very good thing at all. And I think uh, that what we need to do is to maintain more dialogue well, with each other and with other major actors. So we had... Uh, for many years, the strategic and economic dialogue with China, neither side liked it. It required a lot of work at a very high level and a staff level. But those dialogues, until they were discontinued by Donald Trump, worked. And they worked well at addressing issues when the meetings were on. And when the meetings were not on, people on one side, if they had a problem, knew who to call on the other side and could address the issue. So I think we need to identify those issues, um, like uh, Helga said, um, that are in our national interest, our joint or our uh, multi-party national interest. And she mentioned food. Well, you know, war and peace is another. And frankly, I think that uh, world public health is the most important thing that we can address at the moment. Because we've seen over the last three years, uh, especially if you look at the difference between the global north and global south, um, that we didn't do a good job on COVID-19. Uh, we have a lot of lessons to learn. And what worries me is that scientists tell us that it's not a question of when, but if the next new coronavirus or uh, virus comes our way. And it might make COVID-19 uh, look like it was mild, which no, it wasn't from what we've been living through the last couple years. So I think we have to identify those issues uh, that unite us and work on those. There's too much zero-summing going on. Mm -hmm. Too much zero-sum going on. Uh, Zhao Hai, of course, you know, uh, the, the year 2022 uh, saw the engagement between Chinese leadership and uh, European leaders, for example, uh, German Chancellor Scholz visited Beijing and Chinese President Xi Jinping met with uh, the French counterpart uh, Macron and other uh, European leaders. How do you describe uh, the, uh, are we seeing all a strengthened or reinforced engagement between the two sides? Well, um, I would say these visits help to stabilize uh, European-China uh, relationship because, as you know, in the past year, Europe has experienced uh, one of the biggest security challenges after World War II. So, therefore, Europeans are reconsidering their security stance and also um, their connections, uh, economic and political, with the outside world. And in that uh, rethinking or review of their strategy, uh, there are some, um, you know, wrong ideas coming out. So one of those is that they wanted to reduce so-called dependency on China. And uh, some of those even go further as to collaborate with the U.S., wanted to decouple with China to a certain extent because they believe that uh, economic connections, just like their energy dependency uh, with uh, Russia, is dangerous to uh, EU security. However, China posed no geopolitical security threat. Uh, to European countries and actually economic ties with Europe help Europe to become what uh, EU is today. So th those are really win-win situation and mutually beneficial relationship between the two sides. And right now, I think what Europe needs most is strategic autonomy, which means that Europe must be independently thinking about their strategic and economic ties with China, not to be influenced too much by the uh, United States or by the current security situation in Ukraine. So that's why I think these visits are very important because that's clarified China's uh, position on Ukraine issue and also clarified China's continuous emphasis on comprehensive strategic partnership with the EU. 
So uh, moving forward, there will be more European leaders coming to visit China, and China will uh, start visiting uh, EU again. So I think uh, this will uh, help to stabilize the relationship, not only with big countries like France and, and Germany in EU, but also many other countries in Southern Europe, Northern Eastern Europe, and those uh, countries need to you know, find a new stance uh, or a new starting point with China and renew their understanding uh, about China. One good thing, of course, is that many of those countries in Europe don't want to go to a new Cold War or don't want to go to a new bloc confrontation or division of the world. So I think uh, the majority of Europe have a clear eye on what's going to uh, follow if they continue to, you know, uh, one-sidedly uh, following U.S. Uh, uh, policy towards China. They need to find an autonomous or independent policy towards China. Mm -hmm. Well, Zhao Hai, as China uh, relaxes uh, this, uh, 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 I would say, like a, uh, st <laughs> previously strict measures in terms of the control and the prevention of the COVID-19, and the country is opening up its economy, society, and uh, the international exchange and trade are uh, expected to be much further facilitated uh, uh, in early next year or in January, uh, very soon. Uh, so are we going to see uh, the, conti the continuation or the strengthening of the engagement between the Chinese side and uh, uh, many partners, basically the rest of the world? Well, absolutely. If you, uh, well, first of all, if you compare last year and this year's uh, Wang Yi speech, there's one significant difference. Last year, China emphasized uh, COVID diplomacy, and this year is the head of state diplomacy. And next year, of course, the number one issue is also the head of state diplomacy. That means the Chinese leaders and also Chinese diplomats will go around the world, uh, you know, improving relations and ties and re resuming dialogues with many other countries, uh, developed and developing countries. And number two, if you look at uh, Wang Yi's uh, other top priorities, is that China will develop old direction diplomacy. Uh, that means China will deepen its ties with international organizations, with countries, neighboring countries, and also following China's tradition, uh, the number one diplomacy uh, will probably be in Africa. And also considering what's happening in Latin America and what happened in uh, the Middle East, China will also deepen its ties with Arab countries, with, with Latin America. So those are uh, the uh, bright side, I think, for China uh, in terms of diplomacy next year in 2023. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.